Hi, we continue in Genesis 29 after Jacob has understood, perhaps wrongly, that Laban has agreed to give him his daughter Rachel in exchange for seven years of hard labor. Uh, so as we continue in the story, we reach one of the great twists in the whole book of Genesis. But as we do, we're going to see there are many stories before it that set us up for this and how we interpret it will depend upon how we read the whole book of Genesis so far and the stories that echo into our scene here. So as we enter into this story, I'm reminding as we've been going through this unit that we're now in this middle section of the whole Jacob story with Jacob and Laban here as we see, and we're on this section here, which corresponds to the chiasm that goes from 28.10 all the way through 31.18. And now we're in this B section here as we started last time. And after this, we'll see that the next section between Rachel and Leah, when they have sequential pregnancies that produce all the eponymous names of the tribal ancestors of what would become known as the 12 tribes of Israel, it has its own little chiasm there. And when we get to that next time, we'll focus on the feminist criticism of this section and what it's saying about women at that time. And we'll get to a little of that today around Laban taking control of four women here, not just his two daughters. So as part of that, as we've been looking in this section, we're reading this on at least three levels. The immediate plot of Jacob in this situation with his extended family looking for a woman. The oracle that was given to Rebekah back in chapter 25 that indicated two nations are in your womb that highlight that Jacob will become Israel at the end of this unit in chapter 32 and 33. And then we'll see after that that Esau is Edom, something a narrator tells us multiple times in case we forgot it. So we'll see the development of two nations and their rivalries as we return to the second part of the Jacob and Esau section. But also we're looking at this post-exilic section as we saw uh, earlier in chapter 28 around the question of Bethel and Jacob's experience there. But throughout this unit with Laban, we're seeing how one of the questions is, what is the relationship with the people of the old country? And as we enter into this story more deeply, we're going to see explicitly that Laban is calling upon a tradition foreign to Jacob. It's not done in this place, unhelpfully translated by the Norris V in our country. But the issue is not country, as like we think of nation states, and that nothing like that is ever mentioned. Laban never claims any national identity at all but in his place. And although the place isn't named as Mesopotamia, and there's no mention here of the Mesopotamian god Sin, the moon god, from whom Laban gets his name, meaning white. And we'll look at that more when we look at the story of the separating of the goats and sheep into different colors and what that has to say. But now Laban will make explicit that Jacob is not prepared and maybe the Israelites are not prepared in exile for encountering the Babylonian culture and knowing what they could take with them and what they couldn't. And Laban is, uh, you probably already know, is going to end up trapped here by Laban's deception uh, for 21 years. And as we've also been looking at, um, this story also expresses for the sake of the um, exiles the question of deception and how much you can trust what's going on there and how much not. And the immediate plot point, I was suggesting that in chapter 27, the plan for Rebecca, which I was suggesting was also a conspiracy with Isaac, to get Jacob to practice deception on Isaac before his parents sent him back to the master deceiver, uh, Laban here, whose deception has its first indication here. So that's one of the, the elements of the story we're seeing as well. And today we're going to see, as I've been noting since the introduction of this unit, how Spolstra's 2021 article shows the many elements in common with the wife-sister stories we saw in Genesis 12, 20, and 26, but also in versions of that. So we'll begin to be looking at the issue here as we see the deception that, that takes place. But here, the deception is not by a patriarch to a foreigner because of his wife slash sister, but from the foreigner to the patriarch because of his, uh, the wife slash daughter, as we'll see. And speaking of the daughter, as I've been noting throughout this whole section, I'm suggesting it works also as an allegory of the monarchy in exile. And we'll see today how Laban is deceptive, paralleling, paralleling how Saul was deceptive in the David context there. Uh, finally, for this purpose, we're looking at the key words. And throughout this unit here, we're going to see seven, serve, which could also be slaved, and give. And I want to note that the language of give is highly ambiguous, much like we saw with the Hittites back in chapter 23, when they kept insisting they would give Abraham the land for a burial place. And he kept arguing back, wait a minute, I'll pay you for it. 
And in the videos I did on chapter 23, I was highlighting how Abraham uh, understood well that what the Hittites said on the surface was not what was going on beneath it, using Sternberg's work on um, politeness and profits uh, as part of reading between it. But Jacob didn't read Sternberg, and Jacob didn't watch my earlier videos, and Jacob didn't learn from his grandfather Abraham, who as far as we know he's never met. So he's going in naked to Laban here, and not, nego not understanding that what Laban has told him isn't anything clear. So we saw back here last time that Jacob said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Notice he didn't say what the service would consist of. Um, and Laban didn't say either. And Laban said, it's better I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. But he didn't say he would give her uh, to him any more than the Hittites said they would give the land. Um, they said nobody would withhold it. So it's the kind of double negative stuff that makes it sound like it's a positive, but it's not exactly the same. So with that ambiguity, we enter into our story recognizing that Jacob has no clue of what he's going to face. And as we look at verse 20, um, we see Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Um, the seemed here um, is literally, uh, and it became in his eye one day, so notice the one day in a few days. They seemed to him one day um, because of the love he had for her. And what happens during these seven years? They just go by in one verse. What was Jacob doing? Uh, we're going to find out a little bit later uh, in chapter 31, verse 40, that he became a field hand and shepherd after the 21 years when he'll complain to Laban that he couldn't sleep and it was hot and cold, etc. But we don't know that now, and the narrator has withheld that, so we don't see Jacob in a particular role. We simply see him as servant of Laban. And what was his relationship with Rachel this whole time? Seven years go by. As far as you know, it's just in a household, although we're going to find out in a couple of verses. Here, Laban gathered all the people of the place, and we don't know how extensive that is. Is that the whole population of Haran? He doesn't say of the city. He just simply says Macomb, the place, echoing what we saw in chapter 28. But I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, we don't know anything about what happened during these seven years. And Rachel plainly has to be in on this. She's of the same place that Laban is, obviously, so she knows what the customs of the, there, are, there are there. And probably her whole childhood, she's been waiting for her older sister Leah to be married off so it can be her turn, according to the patriarchal norms that guide women's lives in that context. So she has to know about this. There's no way that she doesn't know, and yet somehow we're to understand that she kept complete silence from Jacob for seven years. Years. And he, if he's loving her so hard that it seems like a day, did they not have any time together? Did they not have any glances? Could he not see in her eyes uh, that something was going on? Apparently not. So the training has failed. He was able to lie to his father, but he's not able to see through the situation that Laban has put him in. And he's going to pay the price of 14 more years of, of virtually slave labor. So after the seven years we hear this, Jacob says to Laban here, and as Westerman notes, one suspects that Laban is not so much thinking that the agreed time has come, rather he does not want to lose a good worker. Jacob must demand his earnings. And although Westerman is not a modern literary critic, uh, he's certainly someone from the historical method that prevailed until the 1980s and 90s and, and more recently, um, he certainly understands what's going on here. Um, the, the character of Laban has spoken vaguely to Jacob to extract as much wealth as he can from him, much like he celebrated uh, how blessed are you of Yahweh in the previous generation in chapter 24 when Abraham's servant came with the caravan of camels and all the, the bracelets and nose rings uh, to put on Rebekah. So Laban, we know, is oriented around wealth as blessing, and all Jacob can offer is his labor, and he's going to get his, Laban's going to get as much of it as he can. So Jacob now says to Laban, after seven years, and we don't know any conversation they had other than his promise to serve just a couple of verses, but seven years earlier, give me my wife, using a different word for give, not in a ton, as we'll see a number of times, although I highlight it here because it has the same concept, even though it's not the same word. Give me my wife or my woman that I may go into her. And that's, this is plainly a, a sexual language here. So he's not looking to say, uh, I want to have dinner with her or to spend some time with her. He's basically saying, I've been waiting seven years to have sex with this woman I love, and now it's time. And the translation here covers over a couple of important things, both here and in another place where it's just completed. For my time is completed, literally my days are filled. So they seem to him as a day, not a few days, but they seem to him as a day, but now his days are filled. 
and we notice the play on days and weeks and years because they'll talk about the week of service but really it's seven years not seven days of course so in response to this notice that Jacob or that Laban doesn't say okay I'll do that he doesn't answer him in words at all instead he answers in actions that we see here um, and as my note below has, Jacob's family are absent just as Rebecca's were at the previous wedding uh, in Sarah's tent. It gives an opportunity for Laban to take advantage even further. So Laban gathered all the people of the place. And what are we to imagine here? Um, again, the, the author has given us very little information. We know there's a well where the shepherds were. We know that uh, Ra uh, Rachel ran to the home and to tell her father and that Laban ran and then uh, welcomed Jacob into his house, as we saw. But we don't see anything about a house. And we don't know if there's a neighborhood of houses. Do they live in a, a little piece of Haran? You'd never know this is a city. You'd think that it was just a man with his daughters and some sheep around. And now so vague reference to the people of the place. But by calling it Macomb and not naming it as Haran or not even calling it a city, it's really drawing attention to the contrast between the Macomb in chapter 28, where Jacob's experience was, God is in this place and I didn't know it and the question of whether God is in this place. But in this place, there are gods, but it's the, the, um, the moon god Sin and Sin's uh, consort and the other god of light that I know, mentioned in the last video uh, that Laban's relying on, at least implicitly, because we'll see later he explicitly calls surprisingly on Yahweh. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. So he called the people of the place, again, we don't know if that's ten or a thousand, and made a feast. And the feast here is a mishtah, which is a drinking feast. Um, it's not a, a grand meal. It's not like what we see a Abraham and Sarah provide for the visitors in uh, Genesis 18 with the fatted calf and all that. It's more like, as we see from 19.3, what um, Lot provided for his visitors. It's also in 21.8 what Abraham provided for, provides for the weaning feast for Jacob. Uh, and then there's one more example in 26. But they're all feasts made by men. Uh, and my note below adds it is here, both a wedding celebration and a chance to get Jacob drunk. The root meaning of this word is a drinking occasion, so we won't notice the switch. Of course, it's not a surprise to get the, the groom uh, drunk or the bride drunk on their wedding night. Uh, that's across many cultures uh, that would allow for that kind of festivity. But it certainly does suggest that Jacob's um, uh, judgment would be impaired, especially in the dark and with the woman coming in with a veil. So uh, we hear nothing further about the festival. Again, it's just said in one verse. And now it's evening. And as my note below has, the narrator gives the reader the quote-unquote answer and allows us to watch while Jacob experiences the ploy. As Westerman notes, the custom that requires the bride to be led veiled to the groom makes the deceit possible. And again, my note below has how Leah plays the passive role in the father's deception, just as Jacob did in the mother's deception in chapter 27. There is no reported conversation to judge how Leah felt about being part of the plan, in contrast with Rebecca in the previous generation. Nor, I could add, is there about how Rachel felt about being part of the plan as well. So in the evening, as it's getting dark, he took his daughter Leah. And notice how Laban is portrayed here as a typical man in a monarchical context, in a, in a male-dominating patriarchal context, taking women and doing what he wants with them. And we can recall in the parallels with the monarchy story in 1 Samuel 6, the verb for what kings will do is used six times in uh, 1 Samuel 8, 11 to 17. Take, 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 take. And one of the things the king will take is your daughters. And so here Laban is not a king, but he certainly represents the powerful forces in Mesopotamia. And he takes his own daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. Um, and as my note below has the parallel, the male actions, the bringing her to Jacob and he went into her is using the same word here, uh, the same verb bow, but in the hiffle form or the qual form. So Leah is being acted on consensually or otherwise by two men. And we're going to look more in the next video on um, uh, the criticism that feminist scholars have rightly made to how the story portrays the women as simply objects in the male machinations here. So we're to Jacob, and he went into her. And many folks have argued, how could he not know? But I think I've suggested the ways that the text uh, makes clear. Uh, that it's at night, and he'd be veiled, and he'd be drunk, and he'd have, he has no reason, as far as we know, for having to be suspicious. So he's not looking that closely. And if we don't want to be too crude about it, maybe his focus at that moment, after seven years of waiting, wasn't on the face that would identify her. As far as we know, he's never seen any other parts of either daughter uh, or sister because they've been covered up. 
So he goes into her and the narrator adds a little detail here that will become important as we'll see and I'll highlight that. Laban gave his maid, which I'm translating uh, throughout as uh, maid servant, as you can see here, uh, Zilpah to, to his daughter Leah to be her, um, her maid servant, so to speak here. Um, Shifha, as I note. And I note the maidservant here because when we looked earlier at the language of women's relationships and men, uh, to men in these chapters, we see here he gave um, the maidservant to Bilha, Bilha and Zilpah to the daughters to be their maidservant. But later, they give them uh, to, um, to the others as a wife, as we hear. So she gave him to Jacob, her maidservant Bilha, as a woman or as a wife. And we see the same thing uh, with Zilpah. So uh, what is being given as a maidservant uh, to serve the, the daughter in her marriage is like a present can be made other use of, as we'll see later on. And that will also involve the question of the, the local moon god Sin, who is responsible in their cultural context for women's fertility. Um, so this is the first time we hear about Zilpah, and as Will Gaffney notes, Zilpah is presented as another pawn in the war for Jacob's attention and affection. The battlefield for that war was the bodies of Bilhah and Zilpah. Um, and as Weiner Mark notes, how few commentaries, including feminists, address these two, who are treated in rabbinical literature as isha, as wives. So um, that's, that's probably in the rabbinic literature, as we'll see, to preserve the integrity of the tribal founders as worthy to be Israelites. So they have their own justification, not that they're concerned so much with Bilhah and Zilpah as they are concerned with the status of the offspring. So Laban gave her maid Zilpah, and then when morning came, it was Leah. And it's a wonderful way the text presents that, um, and so it's a surprise to us as it is to Jacob. Um, my note below has that Jacob has inherited his father's Isaac's blindness and shares in Leah's weak eyes, if we read the, the adjective describing um, her earlier as weak and as eyes rather than how she looks. So that would certainly fit that interpretation. Is this, as Shea Held suggests, divine payback for Jacob's deception of Esau and Jacob? Or is it the reason for training Jacob in deception to avoid the trickery of Laban? In other words, we have to be asking, which the text doesn't say, is correlation and causation related to Yahweh or Elohim's actions here? Is that how God works uh, with, with a karmic sense of payback? Well, Jacob, you deceived your, your father and your brother, and so now you're going to get paid with deception. Or is it, as I was suggesting, simply this culture gets what it does by deception, and so you're going to have to be trained to be at least as good a deceiver or at least a reader of deception to see through that. Um, and readers can read that either way, as God's doing or not. Um, and so, as the Midrash says below, um, he said to her, What? You are a deceiver and the daughter of a deceiver. And she retorted, Is there a teacher without pupils? Did not your father call you Esau? And you answered him. So do you two call me and I answered you. So the Midrash really gets that without attributing it to Yahweh, though, simply saying uh, what comes around goes around, so to speak. And so now Jacob says to Laban, which is not in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, but supplied by the Septuagint, what is this you have done to me? And the, the line, what is this you've done to me, echoes the, all the wife sister stories as we see here. And we'll also echo uh, a couple of stories into 1 Samuel, uh, as we'll see also as part of the, the parallels here. Um, so we'll see a, a couple of parallels about that um, as we go. So did I not serve, for, serve with you for Rachel? Um, why then have you deceived me? And, and this is also the parallel. So we can see here, why have you deceived me here? Um, echoing Saul to Mishal here, um, but also in 1 Samuel 28, 12 and in 2 Samuel 19, 27. I didn't put those all up there. So plainly uh, parallel there and the use of the word is rare and this is one of the only other uses of it in the PL form. As my note below has only here in the entire Torah, let alone just in Genesis. Um, so this is where we get to the crux of the matter. And as Westerman notes, the accusation that Jacob directs at Laban ricochets off Laban's self-justification. He had only acted in accordance with the custom of the country. But as I've been trying to note earlier in this, own, this very video, not country, but place. Um, the phrase, this is not done, is otherwise used in situations of strong moral opprobrium, like we saw in chapter 18 and, uh, and in chapter 20 around the wife-sister story. As Sarna notes, Laban feigns outrage as though Jacob were the guilty one. 
Um, so not done in our place here in Macomb, uh, linking with the people of the place present in the feast up here in verse 22. Uh, as one of notes, doubtless there was a barbed underhanded dig in Laban's words. It was not supposed to be done in Isaac's family either, yet Jacob had. Um, um, giving the younger before the firstborn. And notice the language here is younger and firstborn in contrast to what we saw earlier, which was the greater and the lesser or the, the larger and the smaller. Um, so here we have the younger and the firstborn uh, echoing explicitly from chapter 27. So, um, so having expressed the objection and suggesting, Jacob, you should have known this. Didn't your mother, um, my sister, tell you this? Um, but he doesn't have to say that. And plainly, as far as we know, Rebecca didn't say that. Um, Rebecca, as far as we know, doesn't know anything about how many children Laban has. How would she? Um, so as my note below has in verse 27, Laban directs all the action without asking what the daughters wish and contrasts the giving of Rebecca by her own consent, as we saw at the end of chapter 4. So complete or and give here, my noting uh, in the uh, key words, how many times give comes here. So give the week... And notice how he makes it sound like it's just a week, but we're talking seven years. And the word for week, Shavuot, as in the festival of weeks, or Shavuot, um, one of the three major Jerusalem festivals, according to Deuteronomy 16 and parallels, um, is often understood as a euphemism for the seven years. But Sarna interprets it as the festal bridal week, which comes at the end of the stipulated seven-year period later in the verse. So it could be seven years in a week, or the week could be a euphemism for the seven years either way. And notice how now it's plural, and we just like we saw with the Hittites in chapter 23. So Abraham tried to negotiate with a particular Hittite, and the Hittites recognized that um, you're negotiating with all of us. This is collective. And similarly here, although this is plainly Laban's daughters, in this cultural context, they're understood as the community's daughters. And we'll see more about that in the dark story in chapter 34, when a community's daughters and sons are all treated in a similar way as that, but with violence. Um, so we will give you the other, um, literally more over this one. Um, and my note from Jean San notes that whereas Jacob refers to her by name, her father speaks of her abstractly, perhaps even contemptuously, in return for serving me another seven years. And you think that Jacob would be suspect here, um, but he's not. We just don't hear a word from him. We simply hear that Jacob did so and completed his week. Um, as Westerman notes, Laban has destroyed something. He has infringed crudely on the blossoming love between the two. But isn't that assuming things we don't know? Um, and that goes back to the issue of was it that Jacob encountered with Rachel a love story? All we heard is that he loved her and he kissed her. But we've heard up to this point not one word about Rachel's feelings about Jacob, whether she wants this man or not, whether she just wants any man to be married to to get away from her father or to be completed as a woman in a patriarchal context. We know nothing about it. Um, so we don't know anything about this being blossoming love. That's a romantic notion, notion being imposed on the story. Um, but it says, Jacob completed the week, so now another seven years have gone by. Then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, as a woman. And so it happens after 14 years, although interestingly, we hear nothing about their wedding night. We simply hear this, the parallel, Jacob gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid, exactly parallel with Zilpah above. And so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, um, which sits in tension with what we'll see next time. And he served Laban for another seven years. So now it's 21 years, and still we hear not a word from Rachel. Um, so Rachel and Leah are just passive here, and it's not going to be until the next verse when we begin to have the camera shift and the perspective will focus on the rivalry that patriarchy has made between the two sisters. So we'll see you for that next time. Bye-bye.